Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody, for the birthday wishes. I'm excited to be here to welcome our, our next presenter. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, a big welcome to all my colleagues across Advancement and the UW for joining us um, for this impactful conversation. I've spent five years working with or adjacent to UW, um, and prior to that, I obtained my MPA from the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance. And before that, I worked in college access work with a nonprofit in Cleveland, Ohio. So my two passions, are higher education um, and access to higher education. Um, before I kick this session off, please know there will be an opportunity for questions at the end of Wilson's dialogue. So please utilize that chat during um, this session, so many questions you may have for Wilson. All right, so now I have the joy of introducing somebody I go back to undergrad with, Wilson. I'm sorry, it is now Dr. Wilson Okello. Uh, I can't help but to warmly refer to him as Wilson because he's always been a very humble, genuine, community-oriented, and personable mentor. When I first met Wilson as a freshman, he was a year ahead of me and served as a peer mentor on campus at Youngstown State University. And I remember meeting him and being in awe of a person so solidifying what it meant to be a peer mentor. Of course, freshmen were assigned different peer mentors, and we had the full roster of mentors available for detailed comparison, so we did. And I have vivid memories of the conversations with people desiring or bragging about having Wilson as their mentor. It appeared so natural for him. He was so fully himself, yet was able to grasp the individualism of each person he encountered and their varying perspectives. It was so powerful. The next year, I had the pleasure of serving as a student leader along with Wilson. Him a community advisor, me a resident advisor. I got to witness him flawlessly mentor students through numerous typical college student entanglements. He had a way with words and still has a way with words. I cannot tell you the countless people I still know and talk to to this day from YSU who have such positive and fond, me fond memories of Wilson, uh, so positive. There are very few people I can say this about. I have never heard a negative word spoken about Wilson. So it is no wonder he has now tr transitioned into a thought leader for higher education. Researching and speaking on topics such as black feminist theory, anti-blackness in education, critical qualitative inquiry, and creative methodologies to think about the health and survival of black people in the afterlife of white supremacy. He joins us today to speak on decolonizing higher education. The impact that Wilson has on a community has been so real to witness, and I am excited to know that my UW community will have that opportunity to experience that authenticity and knowledge. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wilson Okello, Assistant Professor in the Watson College of Education at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Wilson, passing it off to you. Christine, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes. we, could, we could probably go home right after that. I mean, that, <laughs> I don't deserve that. Uh, you type did. Of <laughs> but uh, I'm so humble, uh, so humble to be able to uh, just be in community uh, with you all. Thank you again, uh, just for this, this wonderful opportunity. Uh, lift up your faces. You have a piercing need for this bright morning dawning for you. History, despite its wretched pain, cannot be unlived, and the face with courage need not be lived again. Lift up your eyes upon the day breaking before you give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it into the palms of your hands, mold it into the shape of your most private dream, sculpt it into the image of your most public self. Lift up your hearts. Each new hour holds new chances for new beginnings. Do not be wedded forever to fear or yoked eternally to brutishness. The horizon leans forward, offering a space to place new steps of change here on the pulse of this new day. May you have the courage to look up and out and upon the rock, the river, the tree, your country here on the pulse of this fine day. May you have the grace to look into your sister's eyes, to look upon your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good morning. 
And to you all uh, at the University of Washington, I say good morning again. Thank you again, Christine, for that, that wonderful introduction. You are indeed a dear, dear friend. I'm so grateful that we've had the opportunity to, to journey together uh, over these many years. Can you all again join me in wishing Christine a, a very happy birthday who, who joined us uh, for this time. Um, Christine, you're just a, you're a great thinker. You're an amazing professional. I remember you finally just thinking about the ways in which you were always committed to community. You were able to bring people together in special ways, uh, both then and as I'm learning now. So um, I'm grateful for the work that you continue to do. Uh, my late grandmother, uh, Geraldine Lacey, she was born and she mothered in the height of Jim and Jane Crow America. She reminded me that more than what people say, people will show you who they are. I believe the same of organizations. They are constructions of people, of power and of choices. And if we can't do this work alone, if isolationism will continue to fail us as it always has, then we were going to need some people um, who work alongside us, who are committed to uh, a common purpose, committed to a common cause. And uh, to that regard, I want to, to thank you, Christine. I want to thank Ellen uh, Whitlock Baker for the invitation as I've watched you, Ellen, um, um, in your roles and, and had dialogue with you. I, I, I'm supportive and I'm, I'm encouraged about how you lead. Uh, thank you, Amy and Rabia, uh, Zoe, for all uh, of your support in, in, uh, in hosting this session, the entire planning team for the work you've done, not just this year, but uh, what you've been doing over the past several years is, is truly, truly impressive. As I begin, I want to honor and acknowledge the land uh, that we stand on as the traditional home of the, the Coast Salish people and the traditional home of all tribes and bands with the Duwamish, Sakwamish, Tulalip, and the Muckleshoot nations. Without them, uh, we would not have access to this gathering and to this dialogue, particularly uh, in Washington and Seattle. I ask that we take this as an opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land and those who are still uh, with us here today. So if we could just take uh, a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Land acknowledgements are, are one way that I believe that we can begin to pay uh, this work for the, the meditation that I began with, with my, uh, by Maya Angelou. Uh, I began there um, as I think about what it means to engage in the serious conversation of paying it forward. In order to do that, we must be willing to look back. One of the things I appreciate about poets and literary minds in general is their ability to chronicle the times, to present us with rich archives so that the past need not be out of touch with the patterns uh, of our history, need not be out of touch with where we desire to go. And so in that regard, if I could borrow your attention for just a short time this morning, I would begin by taking you to East Africa in 1983. And there we would find a woman named Leslie Scott. That year, Leslie Scott would launch a game at the London Toy Fair that would go on to be one of the best-selling games in the toy industry's history. In 2017, it was reported that this game has sold more than 80 million units worldwide, sustaining popularity among children and adults. Even if you don't actively play the game, I'm almost certain that you've heard of it. Some uh, conceptualize this game uh, as a uh, uh, as, a, as a building project. Scott conceptualized this game with her family in the 1970s using children's wooden blocks. The name thus derives from the Swahili term, which means to build. This game is played with 54 wooden block, e blocks. Each block is, is three times as long as it is wide and is one fifth as thick as its length. Blocks have small random variations in them to create imperfections in the stacking process. And this makes the game more challenging. The game, of course, as I'm sure many of you know, is called Jenga, that's right. It comes from the Swahili word kujenga. And as many of you know, the rectangular blocks are first stacked in layers of three blocks to build a tower. From there, players take turns removing blocks from anywhere under this top layer. Once removed, the block is then placed on the top layer and the game continues until the tower 
falls or any portion of the tower falls, the last person to successfully place a block on the top of the tower is declared the winner. It's been reported that the tallest Jenga tower was 40 and two thirds levels high. For, for my mathematicians in, the, in this meeting room, that means that the tower was more than two times its original height. Now, again, born and raised in an East African home, my father was from Uganda, where my father, he intimately understood and was familiar with this game. We would play it all the time as a family. My older brother, my younger sister, and my, my mother, my parents, we would gather around the coffee table in the living room, and there we would take turns. We would try to construct this 18-story tower three blocks at a time. We took great pride in engineering this towers as if we were bricklayers, we would stack and we pressed each block together, each brick together, ensuring that there were no imperfections in the design. When we would often take a step back, we would admire our creation and wonder if we had ever seen something so magnificent. And then the game would start. <laughs> If you recall, uh, the purpose of this game was to, was to build, right, as told by the designer. And the game, it, it, it was titled to build. By and large, my brother and my sister and my mother, we wanted to follow these rules, right? We resonated with the rules. We wanted to build something that, 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 was, that was grand. We took great care. If the blocks made up three layers at a time, we would pull from the middle so that the, the blocks, the layers still had something sturdy to stand on. My father, however, he had a different an approach. Uh, see, see uh, while partially the goal was to win the game, I think we were invested in building a structure that could scrape heaven, if you will. My father wanted to do the opposite. See, much to our ire and confusion, he would look for what stones and masonry might call the cornerstone right, or the, the block that, sets, uh, that, that is set first. The cornerstone is critical because all other stones are set in reference to this particular cornerstone. As my father understood it, if the cornerstone, uh, it was significant because it could tell you about the integrity of a structure. If the cornerstone was placed incorrectly or was off in any way, then the tower was already compromised. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. My father, he would pull these blocks from the base of the tower. Oftentimes he was successful, he would place it back on top, but the rest of us, see, we weren't so fortunate. See, once he pulled this block, the tower had a noticeable lean and sway, which typically meant that the next person to take a block and try to apply it to the top was probably going to lose, which would mean that my father was going to be the winner. My, my siblings and I would often look at this pile of rubble after we, 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 the, the, the tower would fall and we would shake our heads uh, and, and feeling dejected. My mother would look at my father uh, and say with puzzled the belief, uh, disbelief, Seraphim, why would you do that? Why do you continue to do that? My father would simply laugh and he would watch us rebuild this tower three blocks at a time. As you may notice, I said uh, he would watch us. Yeah, I still have some unresolved feelings about this approach, as you can see, but I'm clear now about what was happening. See, I don't think that my father sought to destroy the structure. I think he wanted to win the game. I think he understood something that we didn't see. He knew that if your structure was fundamentally flawed, no matter how smooth its surface or how clean its edges might be, if and when it was provoked, it was going to collapse. See, perhaps he remembered that the wooden blocks all had uh, imperfections in them that we couldn't see and the towers that we took so much pride in were already compromised from the foundation. I can now confess that it was not my father who brought down these towers, but the towers were already preparing to fall. I didn't have the language for it at that particular time, but my father, he was teaching us something about racism and decolonization. See, racism is the, the coordination of legislative and economic policies, social norms and cultural practices that function to minoritize and oppress non-white peoples. It cooperates with other systems and structures such as nativism and xenophobia to mark the other right uh, in both the United States and a global context. Racial justice thus must critique must dismantle and must transform these, these systems uh, and structures of white supremacy. Decolonization is all about unsettling right, uh, the past uh, in, in distinct and, and unique ways. Our policies, our practices, like these wooden blocks in Jenga, are inherently flawed. And like my siblings, 
Too many of us are interested in continuing to build on this shaky foundation, no matter how many times we've been told that it's not working. The answer for many of us is to tell people like my father that they can't play, that they can't participate because they disrupt, they fundamentally disrupt what we are trying to accomplish. Instead of staring at the rubble and rebuilding something new, something different, racial justice and decolonization seek to, uh, to raise and critique the settler, colonialism, uh, the settler colonialism, I'm sorry, and its material effects that have shaped our histories, shape our present, uh, for both racialized people and indigenous peoples, right? How can we begin to sort of think in and through racial justice and decolonization to unsettle the past and to reinvent, to create new possibilities for where we want to be? I started off by, by telling you about uh, my late grandmother, uh, Geraldine Lacey. She, uh, she, she had this, this politics of, of watchfulness. Uh, she again. She was a mother uh, of nine, and she has dozens of of grandchildren and and great grandchildren. I want you to know that um, she was deeply protective of her her family. Uh, it, uh, with her grandchildren, nobody nobody was good enough <laughs> for her grandbabies, as she might say. She was oftentimes the the voice of authority, uh, symbolic if nothing else. Uh, but when it came to partnerships and, and marriage and things like that, she uh, folks would run by her what they thought, right? Um, I can remember uh, my cousin introducing their partner at the time to my grandmother. My grandmother, she held a, a warm but a very deliberate sense about her. She would often lead with a simple question, what are your intentions? That was it. What are your intentions? And then she would wait and she would watch. Now, I've heard rumors. I was, I was small at the time, so I've, I've heard rumors about some of her frank but her accurate assessments that were bound to this question of intentionality. I don't know this to be true, but it seemed uh, like for Grandma Lacey, if somebody wasn't clear or was unclear about their intentions, then they could not value something as deeply as they might otherwise profess. I'll say it differently. If someone was only responding to her question in the moment, right? without a substantive and inclusive vision for what tomorrow might look like, or the next day, or next week, or a year from now, then the person, their vision was most likely just about them and not about their partner. See, grandma wasn't a, uh, 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 a let's wait and see type of person. <laughs> she understood that, uh, that someone's life could be wrapped up in someone else's decision-making. And so as far as she was concerned, she was going to say something about what she observed, this politics of watchfulness as an unremitting vigilance to be keenly observant. I've often wondered where these politics were shaped from. I suspect for her, it comes from being a black woman, broadly understood, and indigenous people of color, their lives and experiences are replete with broken promises, with half-truths, with, with uh, encouragements to be patient, uh, the incomplete and conciliatory gestures uh, that masquerade as opportunities of uplift or gradualism, uh, things that say that we are trying, right? Or, or just give us some time, we are working on it. This is not to suggest that processes should be immediate, they're not. That's not what I'm suggesting, but in many instances, this language of weight, of gradualism can oftentimes mean never, right? Uh, and she had to be watchful because unsubstantiated optimism uh, might mean harm or danger for herself or for her community, right? And so she, she, she taught us about what it means to be watchful uh, of, of people and to be watchful of policies because she knew Right? She knew that for some people and for organizations, uh, they know the language of progress. Right? They know it. They know how to speak the language of progress. Some folks are so rehearsed in the language of anti-Blackness that in the flip of their tone, they can wield whiteness and state-sanctioned authority on behalf of whiteness. Building on my grandmother's wisdom, I want to suggest to you this morning that we are not to be flattered by the proliferation of statements that are coming across. Every department, every university has a statement or some of the name changes while dynamic and so important, uh, they're important in and of themselves. They are not racial justice. They are not decolonization. Again, I'm pleased that Washington, D.C.'s uh, football team is finally changing its name after 
80 plus years. I'm pleased that Princeton is removing Woodrow Wilson's name, right? I, I won't lose a bit of sleep because of some of the Confederate monuments that are coming down and being relocated. But when folks tell the story of the moment, we need to make sure that, that the, 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 the version that we're talking about is correct, right? That for decades, folks have been calling for these rightful acts of civility. And for decades, they've been ignored. We need not forget that students and citizens were arrested for taking down flags, right? For pulling down racist monuments, only to have them raised back up. Communities have been calling for these changes for year after year, which might lead some of us to surmise that what we are witnessing is really just a, uh, a response or the, the intersection of guilt, uh, overt racism, and a politics of activism, right? So beyond the sincerity of words, I hope some of us, some of you will have a Geraldine Lacey type of spirit that says, what are your intentions beyond the moment? What are our intentions? Because if we can get past the what, I believe as Yang calls on us to do, that we can begin to ask the how, and how is only a question that you ask if you are concerned with the mechanisms and not just the motives, right? To be clear, decolonization involves no less than the rematriation of land, anti-racist and anti-colonial practices that would restore the life and futures of black and indigenous people of color, right? The futures that they were meant to follow. To that end, decolonization in our sincerest attempt represents at best an existential crisis for the university, represents at best an existential crisis uh, when we think about what it means uh, for the work of advancement and philanthropy. My goal in this time, the short time that I have left, uh, is not to resolve this colonial dilemma. Indeed, it is huge, it's big, and we don't have time for that <laughs> for today. But I want us to consider how we might commit to an analysis of our work that makes space for racialized futures and indigenous sovereignty. For us to examine what our intentions are for Black indigenous people of color, how we might co-construct, right, institutions for black and indigenous people of color. We are never, right, never uh, as steeped in history as when we pretend not to be. But if we can stop pretending, we may gain in understanding what we lose in a false sense of innocence. I say all that to say that yes, we have done good work. The University of Washington is doing good work. I love the summer sessions that have been going on for the past several years. Your faculty development initiatives uh, are important and, uh, and powerful. I was glad to, to read about the race and the equity initiative that was launched several years ago by your, your president and, and staff. But if the University of Washington is going to be true to the reckoning that I believe is happening in this historical moment, it's gonna require an interruption of how we do our work, right, from an anti-racist and decolonizing set of principles, right, using that as a frame for our work. What do you mean? I'm so glad uh, that you asked. <laughs> uh, if we're going to interrupt our normal, I believe we need to submit ourselves to four fundamental questions. Those four fundamental questions, number one, who is this for? In other words, who is my work for? Number two, how am I positioned? Number three, what power do I have? And number four, what am I willing to give up? Number one, who is this for? Number two, how am I positioned? Number three, what power do I have? And number four, what am I willing to give up? For this first question, who is this for? In other words, who is my work for? We need to sort of think about what it means uh, for us to pay this work for it, and who are we considering uh, when we think about our work? My sense is, is that uh, for many of us in the room, we've had uh, fairly decent encounters with the educational uh, institution, right? With educational institutions, with uh, the, the idea of higher education in general. Uh, hopefully that's a safe assumption, right? Uh, we believe in their capacity to, to transform lives. I believe that these are good things, right? Um, but I believe, um, uh, that we can be doing better, 
right? I believe in the potential of institutions, but I believe that against what I know is a glaring reality for, for non-white, for, for racialized, indigenous peoples. I meet and I work with students who tell me, who write about, who come back to work and teach at universities, uh, not because they've had overly positive experiences, but because there were gaps along the way in their experience. If, you, if we were to ask, if we ask our students, uh, what is their relationship with the institution and its stakeholders, what was it like during their experience? I suspect that we might hear something that might trouble us. Let me be clear, I'm not asking individuals uh, what they liked about their relationship to education. I, I got a call from um, uh, in the advancement office um, uh, at one of my alma maters uh, last week, I believe. And they were asking uh, what I liked about the university, what I, what I love, what, what drove me uh, to the university. Those things are important questions to ask, but this is not the question I'm asking. I'm asking us to think about what their relationship to education was like. We need not look any further than uh, some of the, the, the mental health um, sort of crisis issues that begin uh, to, well, that are, that are here and have always been present, but that are hovering over our nation uh, in this particular time. Many of the, the, the students that we're thinking about right, are simply trying to get through the university, get through their educational experience with some semblance of sanity. They will tell you about the hostility that they experienced. They will tell you about the racism that they had to negotiate every single day. I, I write about this notion of racial battle fatigue and it might alarm you to hear how, how student people of color, how professionals of color have to, to, uh, to navigate uh, racial battle fatigue on a daily basis. Don't take my word for it. We can look across history and we can see the ways that people of color have put their life on the line so that institutions might change. We can look at Arkansas in 1957 and we would find Elizabeth Eckford and eight other students known as the Little Rock Nine as they tried to integrate Central High School. We can look at Greensboro, North Carolina on February 1st, 1960 as four students took a seat at Woolworth's lunch counter. We can look at uh, East Los Angeles in 1968 and we would find uh, uh, hundreds of Chicano Chicano students who staged a walkout, right, because of the treatment of their, their institution. We can look uh, at the University of Missouri in 2014 and Jonathan Butler who staged a hunger strike just so the university might be willing to listen differently and then they graduate, right? They show up, or I should say we show up and we ask to be in a relationship with them, right? The same institution that in essence caused them grief and harm. That, that institution, right, uh, that couldn't see them during their experience wants something from them. My question for us to wrestle with is, why would these students want to be in a relationship with you? Why do you believe that racially minoritized students, indigenous folks will be interested in being part of an organization or institution that routinely encroached on their sense of well-being? If we're being honest, right? Uh, so much of the work that we do is for many or for students who look most like the people in this meeting, who look most like the people on our college campuses, who look most like the University of Washington, right? If we are serious about advancing education for all students, we have to think seriously about how our efforts can engage these students before and during their schooling experience. If we are unwilling to participate, to share in their very pain, we have no right to ask for their successes. We have no right to ask for their rewards. Who is this work for? The second question, second question is, is important. It asks, how am I positioned? This question asks us to think about the ways in which our, our identities are playing out on college campuses, in departments, in our meetings every single day because uh, of racist policies and practices, because of colonization and settler colonialism that we're all a part of, I'm a part of, that, uh, that we all have some proximity to whiteness, right? Whereas whiteness represents the ways that society is organized. What is our relationship to whiteness given our particular identities? A student uh, wrote to me several weeks ago. Uh, she said, hi, Dr. Okello. In light of the, the current protests and movements going on around the country, I want to make sure uh, that I do the right thing. 
and I take a stand for equality. I want to ensure that I do it in the correct manner in order to prevent offending anyone, but I also want to do something uh, to help and not remain silent. I know I will never understand what it is like to be black. This is coming from a, a white woman. And I know that uh, your class uh, taught me so much um, that I've been able to pass on to others. I don't think I realized how naive I was on the matter of race and equality in our country until I took your class. I guess the overall purpose of me writing is to first check in on you and to let you know how much I value your opinion. And secondly, to ask for your guidance on how I can educate myself more in turn and in turn, I should say, educate those around me on how to best support the cause. And I've seen lots of posts on social media, uh, but, I, but I know that all of that is limited uh, in effect if we don't put that into action. Thank you for your time, and I hope that you're staying uh, healthy and well. I appreciated uh, this email uh, because, um, and even knowing this student, uh, what I'm hearing, what I read uh, in this email is a desire to hope, but I also read someone who is wrestling with her identity as a white woman and what it means for her to participate in this work of racial justice and decolonization. It's important that we do this self-work Folks want to jump into action, I think, in this particular moment. I think that is important, right? Um, and I want to come back to that. that. That's important, but we need to be willing to engage in the self-work, to explore our own relationship to whiteness, to white privilege. How have we benefited from systems of oppression uh, and other intersectional uh, areas of oppression to do this work? You need to, to, uh, to, to, to become uh, sort of knowledgeable or to gain some type of uh, uh, proficiency around uh, these dimensions of difference uh, that Jamie Washington might call. Or we need to be aware of what cycles of oppression and socialization are. We need to have some language around that uh, that Bobby Harwell talks about. Uh, we need to spend some time thinking about our intentions. Are we involved simply to resolve our guilt, uh, our shame, or are we involved because we are concerned about the welfare of the individuals we say we care about. I want to challenge us to invest in this process of community. Whiteness, uh, as a, again, as an institution, it trains us to skip the process and go straight to outcomes. I know, again, we have so much to accomplish and we want to jump straight to outcomes, um, uh, but we need to, uh, we need to think about uh, what it means to invest in community, right? to build community that can support each other, to hold each other accountable, right? To think about what it means to be along in a team. I want you to just take uh, five seconds. I want, to I want you to think about your circle right now. Think about your community. Who can push you to be better? Who is pushing you in your community to be better along the lines of racial justice, of anti-racism, of decolonization? Just take five seconds. Who's pushing you to be better? For some of you, that was, that was easy. And I know that's a quick five seconds, but for some of you, that's easy, right? Uh, but for some of us, it means that we might, it might mean that we need to expand our community, right? We need to add or come into community with others who are doing the work, who will push us, who will uh, uh, lovingly make us uncomfortable, right? Um, you're gonna experience resistance on this journey to liberation, but that resistance or that, that, that feeling of, of, of resistance that you might feel, it just means uh, that you're in the right place. Remember, again, that whiteness as an institution, uh, it, it forces us to, to, to remain at the, the level of discussion, of structure, of timeframes, of agendas. We need to get this done by fall 2020. We need to get this done by fall 2021. We need to, uh, to get out of this state of imperfection and just begin the process. Right? And we begin a process by doing some of the self-work, by, by investing in community. Uh, can we ask ourselves, right, personally and as an organization, how we have benefited from whiteness, from, from white privilege, from, from colonization? Right? Where have I ignored racism in my life? Right? To be clear, this isn't this, this uh, sort of uh, uh, Trayvon uh, Martin generation uh, that Elizabeth and uh, Alexander talks about um, isn't new, right? Uh, this Breonna Taylor moment isn't new. This George uh, Floyd moment isn't new. What is it uh, that provokes us in this moment uh, to be, uh, to, to, to engage in these conversations, to do it differently? We need to wrestle. Uh, with that? How can we move from colluding in a system of racism to taking responsibility? 
right? Um, we need to engage in some of this self-work. Who is this work for? How am I positioned? Number three, what power, what power do you have? Alice Walker, uh, she reminds us that the most common way that we, we give up our power is by thinking that we don't have any power. It's simply the ability to shape reality. I believe that we all have power, irrespective of the energy we might spend contending that we are powerless. Uh, as, as Malcolm X uh, often reminds us that uh, the most critical issue facing people um, is this, this lack of a radical imagination. He, he goes on to explain that uh, people have sentenced themselves to a way of thinking and strategizing that is either accepted, advised, or approved. Said differently, we, we've given in to what some people might call a, a false consciousness. So we believe only in things that seem attainable or within reason. This false consciousness, it severely impedes our ability to move through the world with any sort of agency or authority because we're always seeking to go ahead to do and be the things uh, that, are, uh, that seem attainable, right? I think we're programmed in many ways to seek uh, a level of comfort uh, in, this, uh, in this nation. Um, and that severely, again, impedes our ability uh, to act on our own agency. When we can take our agency and fuse it with a power that we have, I believe that we can do the extraordinary. Take Elizabeth a uh, Alexander, for example, uh, as president of the Mellon uh, Foundation. Um, um, they recently, <clears throat> or she recently stated that uh, the foundation uh, will not issue a cent to uh, 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 potential funders uh, or I'm sorry, um, uh, individuals who are pursuing funding um, unless, right, their goals are, um, have a particular social justice uh, agenda, right? What does it mean for her to pursue social justice through humanity and the arts? They're not uh, allocating a cent unless it has a specific agenda geared around uh, social justice. Uh, what, how might we be able to, right, if we're serious about the work, of, of, of racial justice um, and decolonization. How might we be able to work within our institutions, our departments to rewrite missions if necessary, to, to reimagine our values if necessary, to say that this institution as a whole is not just going to talk about what it means to do the work, but our process will not invest in things that do not. What does it mean for us to engage in that type of work? To this end, I want to offer you several questions uh, that were um, sort of curated uh, by Dr. Uh, D.L. Stewart uh, out of the uh, Co uh, Colorado State University. Uh, he offers us a, uh, a powerful reframing of institutional uh, sort of questioning. And Rabia, if you could, you, could you put up that slide? Um, you could put up your slide at this particular moment. Uh, but uh, Dr. Stewart offers us several questions uh, to consider. Uh, the first of those questions asks, uh, or was really sort of thinking about, uh, what does it mean for us to think about diversity and inclusion versus equity and justice, right? Diversity asks who's in the room, right? Equity responds who is trying to get in the room but can't, whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure. Diversity asks, how many more, right, pick your minoritized identity group, do we have, uh, do we have in our department or in our institution than we had, uh, say, last year, right? Equity response, what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups as they are perpetually a majority here? Diversity celebrates increases in numbers that still reflect minoritized status on campus and incremental growth. Equity celebrates reductions in harm, right? Revisions to abusive systems and increases in supports for people's life chances as reported by those who have been targeted. Inclusion asks, has everyone's ideas been heard? Justice responds, whose ideas won't be taken seriously because they aren't in the majority? Inclusion asks, is this environment safe for everyone to feel like they belong. Justice challenges us to ask whose safety is being sacrificed and minoritized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining and dehumanizing views, right? Calling us to think about how we can imagine the line of questioning uh, that leads uh, so many of our efforts, that leads our departments. Who is this work for? How are, am I positioned? What power do I have? 
And this final question I'll leave you with this morning is, what are you willing to give up? If we were to canvas history, we would find people at countless points of departure. Speaking truth to power, let me be clear, doesn't come from surplus, it comes from sacrifice. Don't talk to me about giving something up if you aren't willing to put something on the line. Nina Simone, a sultry singer from, from North Carolina, I'm sure, sure you know about. Uh, she dreamed of being this classical pianist. Her, her training coalesced with her unique gifting would catapult her into the hearts and the ears of music enthusiasts known for her deep, her earthy and rich personal arrangements. Simone would, would utilize her space and influence to compose music that, as she notes, reflected the times. Right, those close to her would say that Simone, she could take a piece of music and literally morph it into experience. Simone, however, would become disillusioned by the hollowness of this popularity and the bright lights. And she wrestled with anger regarding the condition of minoritized people, particularly racialized black people, lucidly and passionately proclaiming once that freedom is no fear. I mean, really, no fear. If I could but live half my life. Those in her camp said she would become difficult to book because she would not stop speaking out. Who is this for? How am I positioned? What power do I have? What am I willing to give up? At the 1968 Olympics, I'm sure you know the story, uh, Tommy Smith, John Carlos, and, and Peter Norman, they became symbols of political struggle in this portrait of open defiance. After finishing first, second, and third in the 200 meter dash, these athletes did the unimaginable with their, their heads bowed during the national anthem. Smith, with a, a right, uh, black glove on his, his right hand, he raised his fist to the sky. Carlos, with a black glove on his left hand, he raised his fist to the sky. Uh, Norman, uh, uh, the white athlete, he, he stood in solidarity with these two athletes and, and wore the Olympic badge of human rights on his jacket. The, this act was seen as a deliberate breach of the Olympic spirit, but uh, according to Smith and Carlos, how could we be celebrated on this podium while at home our people suffer? All of the athletes uh, would face consequences. Smith and Carlos were, were suspended from their team. They, uh, they were expelled from Olympic Village. They were sent home as an embarrassment to their country for the rest of their life. They would occupy, or for the rest of their lives to this, uh, this day even, they would occupy uh, this precarious position of individuals who could have had it all, all the fame, all the riches, all the glory, all the records, but they opted for this place of, of uh, of push, they opted for this place uh, of, the, of the borderlands, if you will. Who is this for? How are you positioned? What power do you have? What are you willing to give up? I don't promise uh, that any of these questions, any of these recommendations will be easy, but I'm persuaded uh, that this is the type of work uh, that is necessary, that this, if we are lucky, can move us closer to doing uh, the work of racial justice and decolonization. It can move us closer to doing less harm, to supporting the very students uh, that we say that, we're care that we care so much about. And with that, um, I'm so, uh, again, thank you all so much uh, for the opportunity uh, to join you all. I'm happy to uh, discuss questions uh, that you all might have, but um, I'll turn it back over to you, Christine. Thank you all so much. Yes, thank you, Wilson. That was um, powerful, I think. And as I stated, you have always been wonderful with words. So that was, I think, um, amazing you, to hear and very well stated. Um, as a reminder, uh, Amy just put um, the thought exchange link in the chat. Please feel free to use that. Um, and I will kick us off with um, one question that has already been submitted. So, um, University of Washington advancement and the university as a whole is a predominantly white space and institution. Acknowledge that, have shared that. Um, and as a part of that, white people have white privilege and uh, white ni niceness that um, does harm to um, black and indigenous people. Um, so how can they own that today? So you said own it today, but then think about the future. So how can, you know, as a predominantly white institution, people go about fixing that harm or addressing that harm? Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I think that's, it's such an important question. And um, so I highlight this notion of doing the self work, but because again, I think um, uh, we oftentimes we see the issue um, and believe that um, uh, we want to sort of jump right to outcomes, right? Or um, sort of the, the moment is calling on us to, doing, uh, to do something. Individuals feel a particular pressure, um, if not from the university, uh, from, from students, from stakeholders, from the community writ large, from the social, political, uh, and cultural uh, uh, sort of moment. Uh, they feel the need to do something. Uh, but I would encourage it, every one of us, again, to think about uh, what is our proximity uh, uh, to whiteness, Right? Um, how have we benefited uh, from sort of whiteness? How um, have others perhaps been disproportionately affected um, in my sphere of influence at the place that I work? Right? Um, if we can think about our relationship to whiteness in a different way, if we can think about how we have uh, been complicit uh, in some of the ways in which our organization um, has functioned, uh, then I believe. Um, that we, be, we can begin to sort of think about what larger outcomes might be. But I don't think we can do that unless we are sort of willing to be honest about how we have all sort of been participants um, in uh, sort of advancing settler colonialism and advancing uh, this notion, um, um, uh, really, really the moment uh, that we're in. And so um, I would call on us all to sort of think about um, what our, um, uh, what are some of the commitments uh, and self works uh, that we can begin to do? Secondly, I mentioned this notion of investing in community. And so whether that uh, might be sort of challenging who we're connected to, right? Um, or investing in, in a particular type of training uh, on our own so that we can be in community with individuals. Uh, there are plenty of social justice sort of institutes um, that are being sort of um, uh, launched and have, you know, long-standing commitments uh, in our professional organizations um, and in community endeavors. I, you know, again, and learning so much about Seattle, hearing about the tremendous work, what would it mean to attend uh, these meetings, not for work, right, not to hear uh, about, you know, or to make a pitch, but simply to be in community with these individuals to demonstrate that I am um, invested in what happens uh, to you all, invested in what happens uh, to these communities. So um, I would challenge us again to do the self-work and then to think about uh, what it means to invest um, in our own communities. And as I believe, as we do that, uh, when we come to the table, right, uh, uh, and the, the proverbial tables that are going to exist at every institution or Zoom meetings, whatever they might be, right, um, then we will we'll come with a different sort of preparation with a different type of language um, um, uh, to, to engage. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Um, and another question. Um, so advancement, they work a lot with faculty in their different departments. Um, so how do our advancement colleagues engage faculty in this work and follow their lead while also carving out um, advancement's own progress? Um, advancement knows they need to let faculty drive meaningful change, but they use it, as a, use it also as an excuse to not make changes. And again, just fall in that comfort. Well, if, if we're talking about what it means to, uh, to consider uh, communities that have uh, been overlooked, um, then perhaps there's a, a lessening of egos, um, uh, you know, that needs to happen both in both, uh, you know, amongst faculty um, and um, amongst uh, advancement professionals. And, and when I say sort of ego, I'm thinking about um, how we come to the table as wanting to do something or wanting to, to, uh, to accomplish something. How can we um, sort of interrupt that line of questioning to think about um, what do the students require? What do they need from us, right? And what roles can faculty play or apply, you know, uh, approach? How might they be able to approach this in a different way, um, uh, you know, than advancement? Uh, professionals might be able to do so. I am, um, you know, I'm, I'm learning that, um, I'm continuously learning that um, at the university that we all, I believe, we all have a heart, again, for students. I think we all, um, because of the ways our, our positions are constructed, we just all care about them differently, right? Or we have, and you know, so um, I believe that faculty are invested in students. I believe that you, uh, vet and some professionals are invested in students. Um, and how can we, if we are, again, if it's mostly about these individuals, these communities, how can we get out, uh, out, get out of the way and allow the student-led uh, initiative to be the driver 
of our, um, our practice, right? Uh, which is uncomfortable for many of us, right? Who are perceived as experts, right? Or people call us experts all the time, or, uh, you know, we operate uh, where we like bring and get, we, we do the work, right? But how can we get out of the way and allow um, the need, right? Um, or the desire uh, to be the driving force of our community um, and not the other way. Um, and I don't know if you had an opportunity to attend the previous session, Wilson, um, but it touched on racial equity um, in a larger org. And a part of that conversation um, talked about accountability um, and that need and it come from leadership. And a question that um, was just submitted that I think is really good is, um, how can we thoughtfully call in white people in leadership to give up a bit of their seat at the table to make racial change? How um, can we call in this leadership, white men and women, um, and hold them accountable. And I think that's a great overlap when we think about decolonizing yeah. um, higher education. Right, right. I mean, it's such an important question um, in this moment. And um, I think about all of the, uh, the ways that um, students are calling on us to essentially get our act together, right? As university folks, stakeholders and officials, right? Um, and so um, this becomes much less about, um, you know, a, um, a director, a, you know, chancellor or anyone else's agenda. And again, if we're serious about the work um, of unsettling some of these longstanding, uh, you know, settler colonial and, and, and racist practices, then it's gonna require us all uh, to give up something. And if we're not interested in doing that work, um, then we need not talk about racial justice. We need not talk about decolonization. Don't put out a statement. I, uh, don't put out, um, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, whatever it is, the, the town halls, right? Because it all becomes performative in that degree. And so I believe that if we're, um, if you're not serious about, uh, if you're not uh, serious, in, uh, serious about engaging um, the hard work of letting something go, right? Power re, uh, of allocating resources, um, then we need to talk about uh, this, something else, right? Because that is not the work uh, of racial justice or decolonization. Um, and so, I wonder um, how um, individuals also can be, uh, um, um, in terms of accountability, um, you know, in this moment, how can we call on individuals to, to set up an infrastructure that allows for uh, continuous feedback, right? And so such that individuals um, don't have the, uh, the, the, the leeway to, um, to not follow through, right? Or to not provide updates or uh, to not be able to, to respond to individuals or, um, uh, you know, um, some of the, uh, the, the proposals that are going forward. So one of the things I've been doing um, is I'm holding on to every statement that has been released uh, at our university. I'm holding on uh, to the chancellor's statement. I'm holding on uh, to our dean's statement. I'm holding on, you know, as a, as a program and department, certainly we're putting out those things. Um, but I plan to show up month after month and to say, um, you remember when you wrote this, right? Um, let's talk about how we're making um, um, how we're making progress on those things. And I intend to do the same thing uh, with my students, right? With our program, with our department to say, these are the things that we talked about, right? Uh, some of us before, but um, as a department collectively, this is what we said uh, we, were, uh, we were about, what we're gonna commit to. How can we use what's already there, what, what many folks have already put out um, as sort of the, uh, you know, the, um, here's, the, here's what we're, we wanna hold you accountable to and, um, how might we begin to sort of follow up on that? So I would say there, it might not be a sort of a reinventing so much as let's take the, the, the resources that are already sort of been put forth um, and let's stay accountable to these things. And, um, and then I think, again, I think for individual, if we're going to do this work, you need to have uh, uh, individuals who are invested in the process, right? Which is going to mean resistance. It's going to mean uh, change. It's going to mean no's. Um, and it's going to mean some yeses, right? It's not going to be sort of yes across the board, um, but how can we begin to sort of, um, how can, what, what are our intentions beyond sort of just the moment? And I think if we can ask that question, um, it'll, it'll lead to sort of longer standing um, institutional change that uh, I think folks are calling for. To follow up on that, um, you know, how do you get, 
how do you get comfortable on the, um, somebody's telling you, be patient, we're working on it. <laughs> you know, it's like they put out this statement, you, you, you're you trying to hold them accountable a month later. Um, but it's like, no, we're working on it. We haven't forgotten, just, you know, right. be patient. <laughs> yeah, on, honestly, um, it becomes less about how I feel about it. Um, and um, I point to uh, the pressing need um, of our students out who have been calling for it, right? So this has nothing, so my discomfort, it pales in comparison uh, to the harm uh, that is perpetually done to our students or perpetually done, again, when I read or, you know, engage in research and I, I hear about these stories of fatigue and, uh, and exploitation and all these things that are taking place, that's my priority, not me, right? And so uh, it would be hard, right, if it was sort of just about sort of my emotionality, but this for me is not about emotions. This is about uh, the, how individuals are experiencing Experiencing uh, something that I'm a part of, right? Um, and if I'm a part of it, uh, then I have a responsibility. I believe we have a responsibility as stakeholders uh, to continue to push it uh, to be better. Awesome, that's powerful. Um, and I think, yeah, like you said, um, truth to power comes from sacrifice. So I think that's a continuous pattern that we need to push ourselves. What are we, what are we willing to sacrifice? What can we do? And I guess um, thinking, following along with that, and we have you know a few minutes left. Um, how do we get comfortable and less adverse to that loss of our current norms? You know, within ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I think that's uh, that's a really important question. Um, you know, and I think about <laughs> there's been a this this question of normal. Um, and I, I'm, probably, I'm coming to the I'm coming to your that question, but yeah. And so, in a circular way, I um, I've been thinking about uh, this question uh, of normal and um, what our ideas of getting back to a normal, particularly in post uh, like what a post COVID normal. Um, might be. Um, and for other, for most individuals, it's sort of getting back to the way things were or being in community or being able to sort of do um, the things that we aren't able to do in this moment. And then I think about um, what was the normal before COVID for so many people, right? I think about how individuals uh, uh, were continuously, uh, you know, the, sort of the harm they incurred before COVID. I think about some of the, the injustice, right, um, that was happening before uh, COVID. I think about um, some of the trauma that individuals were negotiating from day to day before COVID. And I asked myself, like, what are individuals trying to get back to? Like, what type of normal are we trying to get back to? And so, um, you know, as we interrupt this notion of normal, I think we need to sort of uh, reckon with the idea that normal has not meant the same thing for everybody, right? And so if we could think about as normal as perpetually unsettling for so many people and so many lives, um, then then perhaps our normal should change, right? <laughs> perhaps there shouldn't be um, a such thing as, you know, um, you know, our sense of normal so much as, um, you know, how can we begin to sort of write uh, some of the, um, the injustices that have um, that have literally been the sort of the sin and stain um, of our um, of our nation. Um, I think about what we thought or what uh, was sort of projected or what uh, pundits and uh, sort of people talked about was impossible, right? Seven months ago, right? We couldn't think holistically about uh, a living wage for everybody. We couldn't think holistically about healthcare. We couldn't think holistically about some of these issues um, uh, sort of post COVID, uh, but now, uh, sort of, you know, when everyone is affected, when the, the, the most privileged among us um, are, are affected, um, all of a sudden, you know, I, we can, uh, I, you know, we see, uh, uh, you know, checks are rolled out uh, to, to supplement, uh, you know, lost income, or there's conversations about healthcare, right? There's, there's a different type of conversation that's happening. And so, which again, leads me to question, uh, sort of where was this, right? Was it really, um, our, uh, our, uh, that the, the task was impossible or did we simply just not want to do it, right? Um, and I'm leaning toward the latter. And so as I think about that latter, interrupting our normal um, has to become, again, uh, less about our own conveniences, less about our own comforts and, and more about um, how we can, um, again, sort of write um, and begin to sort of um, um, 
uh, challenge some of the longstanding uh, systemic issues that um, have plagued our country. And I can't believe our time is quickly ending, but um, <laughs> I want to keep hearing from you. Uh, but I actually want to fit in uh, one more question. Um, so uh, a lot of the past couple of sessions have been focused on white staff and leadership, um, but I think it's important. Is there any advice to our staff of color you have in this moment um, as you think about? Uh, protect your energy. Yes, please. Uh, protect your energy. Um, protect, um, your, uh, protect, protect your spirit. Please take care of yourself. Right. So some of this uh, work, again, uh, people of color um, have been leading this charge for, for, for decades, right? Um, and in many ways, they're being called to the table in a different type of way, right? Um, you know, uh, as meetings are, are happening, individuals um, are being, uh, are, are, are all of a sudden being summoned for their expertise or to, to offer a particular experience um, uh, that we're missing, if you will, or, you know, all these sorts of initiatives um, are, are now sort of being, um, uh, laid out that uh, sort of include a perspective that has always been there, right? But has long time, a long been ignored. And so um, you have a right to say no, right? Um, protect your spirit um, and, um, you know, contribute when and where and how you decide, right? Um, because if, <laughs> um, if we're being honest, right? Um, um, you know, white supremacy, um, is not altruistic, right? It's not gonna sort of have this sort of wake up and like let's um, like right the ship, if you will, right? Um, it's gonna take time. And as individuals, um, as sort of institutions are working that out, um, people of color, again, um, will have to bear the, the unpaid labor, will have to bear the brunt, will have to bear uh, sort of the, the, the page, the, the, the being asked to wait or the patience, right? Um, that has oftentimes been incurred upon them. And so um, again, my, my message to you, please think about um, your, your spirit to think about uh, protect, uh, conserving your energy um, and to do the work that you feel compelled to do um, and not uh, the other way around. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with us. Um, I'm grateful to have known you for as long as I have, and I'm thankful that you've been able to come to our UW community and impart such beautiful thoughts. So I appreciate it and yeah. um, hope, hope it was helpful. If, if I can be a resource and, and just a thought partner, um, you know, as you all move forward, um, please let me know. I'm grateful for, again for you, uh, Christine, and, and the work that, uh, that you're doing. Um, uh, thank you all uh, for, the, for these sessions uh, that you're doing. Um, I wish you all well. And again, I'm happy to be uh, in community with you all as you move forward. All right. Thank you, Wilson. Thank you, everybody.